I would also like to give a shout out to Christian Hempfling, who is a extremely valuable member of the community, uh, does so much work on plasma accessibility and has so much passion for it, and who proposed the first accessibility goal in 2019. And it's uh, great to have the accessibility goal uh, elected as one of our goals for the coming few years. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, if you're in this room right now, I imagine you're someone who cares about uh, the growth of KDE as an organization, the spread and adoption of free software by people everywhere. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today through the lens of accessibility and compliance specifically. So I am David Colain. I've been a KDE contributor since 2018, starting in promo and communications, also doing some builds and packaging. And I am a cloud and infrastructure engineer at Bixel. Bixel is a contractor who works pretty much exclusively with the United States federal government. So accessibility is a hot topic there. Uh, it's highly important and we're going to get into some of those regulations today, at least at a high level. And uh, in terms of my duties and in, in job, I do a lot of DevOps and uh, infrastructure operations. And let's actually get started. So what is accessibility in the first place? That word gets thrown around a lot, but uh, let's just make sure we know what we're talking about. And what it really is fundamentally is just to make a product usable for as many people as possible. And that's regardless of any physical or cognitive disability or any kind of other impairment that they might have or even, according to some definitions, uh, socioeconomic status, which at least on that front, uh, KDE, I think, does very well. And uh, this includes not just physical and cognitive, but also, uh, as a further example, uh, vision problems, hearing problems, uh, limitations with motor skills, and uh, cognitive and neurological issues. According to the CDC, 26% uh, of Americans uh, self-identify as having some sort of disability, at least uh, in a minor capacity, for example, that includes uh, needing eyeglasses. But that still is an important consideration of uh, vision uh, when you are designing software or a graphical interface that people need to uh, work with on a daily basis. So accessibility, why is it so important for KDE? Well, there's a number of reasons. Accessibility sits at the nexus of several of the proposed KDE goals that came up in the last couple months. Uh, increased professionalism, uh, becoming an enterprise-grade organization that can deliver enterprise-grade software. Uh, in order to actually get our software adopted at a wider and broader level in major institutions, we're going to need a really good or passable and functional and highly rated accessibility and compliance. And this is also just fundamental to human-centered design and the principles of human-centered design. Because accessibility in many respects determines if big enterprises, public or private, can legally use the software. And this has a knock-on effect that because of that, uh, down the road, this also impacts how many people are going to be exposed to KDE software or free software in general. We all know that since the early days of Linux user groups, the free software movement and community has targeted public institutions as the center of our growth and evangelism efforts, and KDE is no exception to that. 
Uh, for example, some of the history here, uh, Brazil in 2008, KDE software was deployed to uh, school computers serving up to 52 million students based on the activity in the computer labs there. We have active contributors today who discovered KDE and discovered free software through that initiative. Uh, Valencia in Spain, long-standing relationship with KDE, uh, 120,000 or more school computers in their system are running a plasma-based distribution, uh, Lirex. And in fact, Valencia has no budget for proprietary software in the schools except for 10 schools with special needs. Now, you can see where this is going. This is a highly important issue, but also I want to highlight that we do continue to have success in the education sector more recently in Kerala, India. That's a state in India where a uh, plasma-based and KDE software using distribution is deployed in their schools and the government there announced a plan to train and teach 38,000 teachers to use KDE software. And this is a major, major, major uh, push in terms of how we get KDE in front of people. And it's extremely important that we keep up with uh, the evolving standards of accessibility and compliance and KDE, it's fundamental to our growth as an organization to keep the pace and maintain a high level of accessibility in our software. Now, in terms of some of the uh, regulations, the most widespread standard for accessibility in any type of software is in fact a WCAG that is stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. This is a standard from the World Wide Web Consortium and even for desktop software uh, this is referenced in law in United States law, in European law, in many countries. Uh, WCAG is the standard even for uh, desktop software. Now, WCAG organizes itself into, uh, it describes itself in a matter of principles. The most important uh, part of understanding these principles is, in general, the idea that anyone with an impairment should be able to assess content using an alternative sense. So if someone has a hearing impairment, they can use their vision. If someone has a vision impairment, they can use their hearing to aid in their comprehension and understanding of the material. Also important is uh, the ability for people with mobility constraints to use their preferred input methods. Uh, this can be uh, a keyboard-driven navigation or mouse-exclusive or alternative devices altogether. And in the United States, uh, who was a pioneer in this respect in terms of digital accessibility law, uh, one of the most fundamental pieces of legislation uh, was Section 508, which was a 1998 amendment to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Uh, this functionally puts WCAG 2.0 into law in the United States, and government institutions must have a WCAG compliance for not just their websites, but their desktop software, and there are even uh, significant regulations on devices and hardware as well. Another important law to consider here is the Americans with Disability Act, which was uh, passed in 1990. This is broader in scope. It's meant to be a holistic uh, protection of the rights of disabled people in society. It's also important for our purposes 
for understanding the fact that uh, the Amer the ADA applies to public and private enterprises, and that anybody who is uh, an employee of a company or uh, a citizen who is trying to receive some sort of service from the government has a right to request an alternative tool or device or what have you if the device that was granted to them or their working conditions are not uh, accessible to them. So there's a degree of personalized uh, guarantee in terms of what needs to be delivered. Uh, and this comes into play when companies or government entities are considering what vendor are they going to go with for their operating system or a certain application? Are they going to go with a application which is not accessible by default? And then they would have to budget for an alternative in the event that uh, they have uh, disabled employees or disabled customers. And so this is why it's very important in terms of adoption that uh, we maintain a competitive level of providing accessibility options. And in terms of the European Union, uh, the European Union first set out to create a, a European-wide standard with the Riga Declaration in 2006 which cited Section 508 as uh, something to uh, be influenced by or aspire to as a model for what they were trying to do. And eventually this culminated in uh, the excitingly named standard EN301549. Uh, so this uh, current version of this European standard is based on WCAG 2.1 as a baseline level of accessibility. Uh, 2.1 is a substantial improvement over 2.0 in the sense that it provides additional measures for people with uh, neurological issues, uh, photosensitivity, I think memory problems and cogn cognitive issues of that nature. Uh, in addition, EN301549 uh, applies not just to public websites, but like uh, Section 508, also uh, has regulations in place for desktop software, uh, hardware, and mobile applications for uh, government entities. And it, some of the national laws are important to consider as well, because up until fairly recently, there was no European-wide standard. Uh, in Germany, uh, some of the most important laws here are BITV, which was passed in 2002. That stands for Barrier-Free IT Declaration. Now, in its current form, uh, updated in 2019, this essentially just matches the EN301549. Uh, there is also uh, the BGG, or the Disability Equality Act, passed in 2002, which, uh, like the ADA, is broader in scope and meant to provide certain guarantees uh, to disabled people in society. In Spain, uh, there is Law 34 of 2002. Now, this is, since 2012, a WCAG 2.0 compliant, so that's not yet matching the uh, European guidelines, but uh, it does match at least the uh, Section 508 uh, standard. And in Belgium, also, there's a law called the Law of July 19th, 2018. This now, of course, also matches the EN301549 standard. But important to note here is that for uh, public websites in Belgium, if the website is not fully compliant uh, with WCAG standards, they must include a list of all WCAG criteria which are not fully met and cite the WCAG uh, criteria 
uh, annotation that they are missing. So there must be a list present of uh, not missing or inaccessible a uh, WCAG criteria. And that's important to note as we get into this next topic, which is the topic of VPAT and ACRs. Okay, so what is this stuff? The, uh, so, so this actually is highly relevant to KDE because last year we received a request for VPAT from NASA. So somebody from NASA actually wanted to use lab plot at work, you know, for their purposes, whatever these uh, crazy people at NASA are doing. So the initial KDE response was a bit lacking. Uh, people didn't know what a VPAT was. They just uh, saw a uh, email come in from a U.S. government agency that had a lot of legalese in it, and it was talking about some government document. So understandably, I can understand many people in that situation would have a desire to rage against the machine, but what we actually do want to cooperate on this type of thing because the VPAT is the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, which is essentially an extremely thorough accessibility checklist that works uh, the same way as the Belgian law. Uh, it is a list, a self-assessment of WCAG compliance, and you need to itemize the different uh, criteria for WCAG and see where you are strong and where you may fall short based on your own uh, recognition. This is important because the VPAT is essentially the first step towards getting an accessibility conformance report or an ACR. An ACR is a, a US government requirement that you know any software that needs to be used by the government uh, requires this ACR. So without it, uh, it's going to be difficult to get permission to actually adopt, at least on more than a, like a personal level, uh, certain applications. Now, in terms of the accessibility goal, which I'm very happy just uh, was announced earlier this morning, uh, I think this would be worthwhile to uh, maybe consider going through and doing a VPAT for specific applications that we know are targeting enterprise uh, customers or users. Uh, that would be uh, Lab Plot, for instance. Uh, Gcompri uh, is a highly successful uh, education-based software. We just had earlier this year a Belgian educators conference where there was a good reception for Gcompri. And I think Ocular uh, would be a, a good candidate for that as well. We do know that a, one of our uh, newspaper, there's a newspaper in India that our uh, KDE India folks helped get onboarded and using KDE software, including Ocular in the business of their newspaper. And uh, so as far as, I want to briefly go back a little bit in time so we can highlight just how significant the work is that uh, KDE contributors in the accessibility department have been doing for a number of years and uh, show some appreciation for those folks. Uh, when Plasma 5 first shipped, it was not the most accessible thing in the world. And uh, Frederick Gladhorn and a few other people uh, spent a lot of time uh, going back through the code base and doing what is essentially labeling. So this is uh, go going to individual objects in the code base and saying like, oh, we're going to add focus true here. So individual elements can be focused. Uh, and accessible.name, also important. These are labels that are applied to facilitate uh, keyboard navigation, create grabbable elements. And this is important not just for people who are dependent on keyboard, but it's also essential for how ORCA functions 
Orca is uh, the speech, uh, the screen reader on Linux. This is a, a GNOME program, and this is vital, absolutely 100% vital for blind people and people with serious vision impairments. This is how they use the computer. A, a device is uh, reading the screen out to them, and this depends on the uh, grabbable elements, and it also depends on the labeling to some extent. And this is important because even though a number of years have gone by and we've made significant improvements in this area, just because of the scale and size of KDE software, there's still lots of this kind of labeling that can be done to improve uh, further our accessibility. Uh, now, in 2019, Christian Hempfling uh, dropped an accessibility goal proposal with the goal of uh, raising awareness for what was going on in accessibility and putting a spotlight on these issues. Uh, we didn't get the goal then, but what did happen was that accessibility was added to the uh, HIG shortly thereafter. So our human interface guidelines uh, there was an accessibility section which was added to that. That was a very important milestone. And in 2020, uh, Carl uh, wrote an accessibility checklist and also added that. And that was a significant step forward. And we can see uh, I asked uh, Christian to uh, put together a sort of review for the changes in accessibility from that initial proposal in 2019 and uh, on through today. And some of you, many of you may have seen that. Uh, he actually posted a blog post to two-parter that went over some of these issues just very briefly, uh, run, maybe running low on time here. Um, one of the great highlights was the new kickoff. Uh, the new kickoff uh, was, is uh, one of the uh, things that was built uh, after these other things that I just mentioned, like the accessibility checklist and so on. So this was a vast improvement. Uh, there was a lot of, this is, shows the benefit of accessibility being part of the development process from the beginning and then we can have a strong, robust level of accessibility instead of uh, the alternative to that, of course, is people trying to go back after the fact and fix things up. Uh, of course, kickoff was a rewrite, and it was only after the rewrite was uh, finished that we were able to uh, close bugs from 2018. So there are limitations to what can be fixed after the fact, it's essential that uh, developers are really working with accessibility folks uh, in the process. And I think Kickoff uh, was an example of that showing and yielding uh, great results. And uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, for example, S SDDM uh, can't even start ORCA while well, SDDM is uh, up before the actual plasma session begins. So that's a difficult problem. Uh, there's, of course, it, various issues with adding and arranging widgets and specific plasmoids. Uh, however, you know, even since Christian posted his blog up, people responded very well to that. And there have been improvements on, for example, the network manager uh, plasmoid and the volume control plasmoid. So that's great to see that uh, level of enthusiasm and uh, work being put in there. Um, one thing that labeling it can help with still is there are still lots of elements not being uh, spoken by ORCA when it's trying to read uh, what is present. So I think labeling uh, can help there with things like uh, context menu entries and uh, various uh, missing uh, elements in plasmoids and other places. Uh, so to wrap things up here so we can maybe have a little bit of a, a Q&A, uh, it's great to see uh, more interest than ever 
in accessibility and um, this is absolutely fantastic and um, but and I'm very pleased that we got that goal I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what can happen there and uh, Carl and Christian have been building up a, a new accessibility team there's a lot of new people in the last year or two and uh, from a developer standpoint I think it's important to uh, consider like reaching out to accessibility people having accessibility testing integrated into the development cycle that's really the number one issue uh, and use the accessibility checklist another thing I would point out is I think we would benefit greatly from a closer relationship with the Orca developers I know the maintainer uh, Joan Marie Diggs has uh, been active in KDE spaces on and off whenever usually there's activity on the KDE side. So I think there's a lot of potential there that would be uh, beneficial as well. And despite uh, the focus of this talk really being on uh, the impact of accessibility on enterprise and how important it is in the enterprise world, uh, really, the the main motivation for uh, trying to raise the profile for accessibility is ultimately just so we can uh, live up to our KDE manifesto, uh, create an operating system and suite of applications that can is free and available for people to use, um, and that for anybody to use. Uh, we do have waiting in the wings a certain community of people who are, are very happy anytime a new accessibility improvement gets merged. And it's important to uh, remember those people. Those are the users who are even more than typical users, uh, in many cases, dependent upon uh, their uh, computer systems and their electronic devices for their quality of life. And it's always a pleasure. Uh, anything that we can do to empower people uh, through uh, the power of free software and our KDE software. So thank you, everyone, for uh, being here uh, with me uh, this afternoon, if you're in Spain. And uh, if we have any time for uh, Q&A, uh, go ahead and uh, Field, any questions you got? All right, let me check for online questions as well. So, Victoria asks one of our new KDE goals is having better internal processes. KDE isn't inaccessible ran by random chance, but because devs don't aren't great at it. What dev processes would you change, uh, or what dev processes changes would reverse that, would improve it? Well, I think uh, I I showed earlier, maybe like uh, a few years ago, it was uh, fairly common. It seemed that. Uh, accessibility folks were not included uh, during uh, development of like Plasma 5, especially when it was first being uh, really, you know, the transition from 4 to 5. Uh, but I feel like we are moving in the right direction with that. That's why I, I wanted to stress that having accessibility testing uh, during the development process, that is the number one thing. Uh, that can make improvements there. And we saw those improvements uh, in real time with, uh, for example, again, the kickoff uh, rewrite. And uh, Harold, I know, has uh, recently been uh, working on trying to get some sort of automated testing for um, accessibility and compliance issues. If we can pull that off, that would be a a uh, very significant achievement as well. So I think we're on the right track. We do have some ideas of uh, where we want to go 
uh, we just need to be able to execute on those. And I think we'll have a uh, major improvement overall. All right, as well as, as well as, um, cl sorry, closer relationship with uh, the GNOME folks and the Orca developers and other members of the uh, accessibility community in the Linux sphere who are not internal to KDE as an organization. All right, Harold is right here, so. Um, and there's one other question, or more of a comment coming in from Ingo. Uh, who writes, I spent months improving the accessibility of, K Cle of Cleopatra, the GPG key manager, uh, which is used by German and other European government agencies. I'd really like to share my experience with Qt. I guess that's more of a comment about how things could be better. Um, so that's something for later. I imagine we will have some kind of sprint or boff or get together to talk more about accessibility and specific projects. But Andy has a question. Um, I'm not sure if we've met before, David, but this is Andy. And uh, I was going to say, um, if you haven't had a chance to talk to visual design developers, you're welcome to always join the Telegram channel that we have for that. It's, I, I think I'd like to make a little bit of an excuse for the non-inclusion of some of these standards. And I think it's, it's not because there is no desire uh, among uh, visual designers to get this done, is that sometimes it's simply not on the table. Um, and because of the nomenclature of people that we have, we have a lot of junior developers, a lot of seasoned developers that simply this is not a focus. What they what they aim for is to get their code out. You know, this is exciting, this is cool. I would love if somebody can adopt it. But in that, I think we definitely can do a better job of saying, you know, before we merge any of this, let's make sure that you are, you know, complying in some of these areas. I personally have worked in my professional life with some accessibility and building VPAT, and I mean making sure the VPAT is completed properly for my work, but um, I don't think we've formally had discussions like that here, uh, but those discussions are welcome, and those discussions are always on the table, and so if you want to like have a more focused uh, kind of access to the group in that regard, the visual design group is generally a good place to go. I doubt Carl and uh, and others, you know, have seen any negative feedback from requests like that. So I think we're very open to, you know, let's go with it. We're we're all about integration. So just kind of a heads up for you there. Well, I, uh, thank you for that, and I agree. I think uh, the Visual Design Group actually does a good job with uh, concern for accessibility issues. I think that we have improved a lot. Uh, the, some, of the, some of the worst examples that I gave there are maybe a couple years old now. My intention, I suppose, was to show the improvement. I think we're on the right track. Uh, I do think that you're right that some developers don't even think about accessibility, which is not in a negative sense, but they just don't consider it. And that's part of the reason why uh, we have talks like this, why uh, we have like the goal proposal, which was very well received. And I think uh, it, communication uh, is important on this front, communication and education, and showing people the benefits, uh, not just to uh, disabled users or what have you, but to KDE as an organization and to our future growth. Uh, so that's kind of the intent is try to get people maybe a little more excited or start thinking about accessibility and its place in uh, software development. So thank you uh, for your remarks and you know I do, I do appreciate uh, the work that people put in on uh, trying to improve the situation as well. And I think we are on the right track for sure. All right, thank you, David. We are on the right track, uh, but we can get better. Um, 
with this, I would like to wrap up this talk and this session. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes of changeover uh, before the next talk. So thank you again, David.